Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. Mike Pompeo, the United States Secretary of State, said last week in a speech to a Christian organization, no matter what comes before you, I pray that you'll help hurting people stay immersed in the Word of God. That's exactly what this YouTube channel is all about, helping Christians in troubled times by sharing God's Word on our situation. In that speech, Mike Pompeo said, I keep a Bible open on my desk, and I try every morning to get a little bit of time with the book. I need my mind renewed with truth each day. He also agreed with Lincoln, who said, I've been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. The Secretary of State also shared his conversion testimony. He grew up in a church, but in college, too, classmates invited him to a Bible study. Quote, they were very intentional to me in explaining God's word. And after some studying discipleship with them, they helped me begin my walk with Christ. So little did these two college students know that they were witnessing to and discipling the next United States Secretary of State. So do not be weary in well-doing. Sharing the word of God with others will change this world. And what is really amazing here is that there are so many Christians accomplishing so many good things in the Trump administration, defending our freedoms, holding back lawlessness. I mean, Donald Trump may not be a Christian, certainly not a mature Christian, but like Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, he is defending the freedoms and helping the Christians in their need. And for that, as far as things stands right now, I'm going to be voted for him in 2020. Well, the constant news is about the Democrats' movement in Congress to impeach the president. And so this is what we need to discuss in today's program. The Democrats are holding closed-door inquiries in the House Intelligence Committee to find evidence to impeach the president. It's not so much... The president has done these terrible crimes, so let's impeach him. But it's more, uh, let's impeach the president, and so let's find some horrible crimes that he has done. And every headline is about some new statement um, made by Trump's opposition uh, that the Democrats will believe will surely indict the president in an impeachable offense. Uh, The way the media and the Democrats are posturing this debate is that it's a foregone conclusion that the president has violated the Constitution in dozens of points and that he needs to be removed, and all sane persons are supposed to agree with this. And the media is exuberating fake outrage, uh, stirring the pot. Now, I don't get a chance to watch CNN that much. I don't subscribe to cable. But a friend of mine who has a stomach for those kind of things made a very interesting observation. He mentioned that CNN is no longer news. It is simply opinion. One minute to tell a story and then the the rest of the 59 minutes to give the leftist interpretation. Now, of course, I give interpretation here um, on the news. I give a Christian worldview perspective, but I'm not the news. It's just worth noting that the media is discipling the American public in the secular humanist worldview, complete with leftist critical theory, identity politics, lawlessness, government is your savior ideology. And we need to be very careful because many false teachers have gone out into the world. They're from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 1 John chapter 4, verses 5-6. through 6. Well, if you're like me, and uh, 50% of the American public, you're tired of hearing all of this news about impeachment, you're tired of the showmanship, you're tired of the bickering. You know, even though we know that Donald Trump is a loose cannon, Um, We know this is not about actual presidential crimes. This is all wanting to get power back from the Republicans. 
In one survey, 14% of Republicans support impeachment, while 82% of Democrats support impeachment. wonder why there's a difference. In a world where people were totally objective, operating on principles of justice, not on personal gain, you would think that the percentages would be the same. But we do live in a world where might makes right, where truth has fallen in the streets, so righteousness cannot enter. Isaiah 59. Or how about Isaiah 29, verse 20? For the ruthless will come to an end, and the scorner will be finished. Indeed, all those who are intent on doing evil will be cut off, who cause a person to be indicted by a word, and ensnare him who adjudicates at the gate, and defrauds the one in the right with meaningless arguments. They're looking for a pretext, a gotcha moment, to take take down the opponent. What I'd like to focus on in today's program is some spiritual biblical lessons we can glean from this whole uh, impeachment movement. That's what this program is about. What does God have to say about these things? You know, a couple weeks ago, I did a program about the latest accusations against the president, his phone call to the president of Ukraine, where he asked the Ukrainians to look into the corruption of Joe Biden's son in conjunction with the ongoing investigation by the U.S. Attorney General William Barr. Barr is looking into the Russian collusion hoax, how certain people created unsubstantiated accusations in order to spy on the Trump campaign, you know, using the power of the FBI to thwart the Republican candidate for president. The title for that program was The Blinding Power of Ideological Bias, How People Judge the Actions of Others, Whether Good or Bad, Says Just as Much About Them as It Does the Accused. And one of my favorite quotes in this regard is there's nothing more corrupt than waiting until you find out which party someone belongs to before deciding whether his actions are good or evil. And as I mentioned in that program, this is a major theme in the Gospels. The leadership of Israel made all sorts of accusations against Jesus. Everything he did was wrong because Jesus threatened their power. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 24, But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Well, this week I want to continue the subject because the impeachment movement is going to be with us for a long time. And the question I want to address is, why is the left so desperate to impeach the president? Now think about this for a moment. Why don't they just wait till the 2020 election and vote him out of office? They're holding these secret inquiries in the House Intelligence Committee rather than bringing it to the House floor for a regular impeachment vote. Why are they doing this now, not two years ago? Well, let me start off with a statement the president said about all this. And I hope you understand I'm not trying to be partisan in this. I realize Trump's foibles. I mean, he's a president who calls people losers, calls people second-rate politicians, But even if you don't like the president's bluster or his personality, let's be honest and understand the difference between what is an impeachable offense and what is a political hit job. Even Democrats themselves are admitting that this is a political hit job because if one of their own party members did the same things as Trump, you know, they would spin it as tough love or just good old fashioned humor. Well, here's what the president said last week. I think she, Nancy Pelosi, has done this country a tremendous disservice. She has created a phony witch hunt, another one. The first one failed. They all failed. This one is absolutely crazy. All you have to do is read the transcript of the call, read the transcript. This is an open and shut, simple case. They were desperate because they know they're going to lose the election. They're desperate to do something because they're going to lose the election. This administration has created the strongest economy in the history of our country. We have the greatest stock market. We have over 100 times, we have broke the record for the stock market. If you look at people's stocks, their 401k, if you look at anything you want to look at, they are far better off now than they have ever been in this country. So what is the president saying here? Well, at first, the accusations against them are false. They are political pretexts for impeachment. And second, the Democrats know they're going to lose. 
Well, here he has a point. Because it's almost impossible to remove an incumbent president when the economy is doing reasonably well. It is impossible to remove an incumbent president when the economy is doing great. All the current Democrats want to reverse the tax cuts and push the corporate tax rates up to 40% again. And this will destroy the economy. And people know it. And people vote their pocketbook. And also, strangely, the Democratic Party has put forth terrible candidates. All of the frontrunners are over 70 years of age. And the younger ones are no names with very little experience. So we have to ask, is there no seasoned winsome, personable statesman in the Democratic Party that's willing to run in 2020. It almost looks as if the party is expecting to lose and they're throwing these candidates up as sacrificial lambs. There is an unspoken rule in politics that when your party has to run against an incumbent, you let the egotistical fools in your party waste their lives by running for office. Uh, The more seasoned, smart politicians wait for better opportunities. So possibly one of the motivations for impeachment is a way to get rid of having to run against an incumbent. A second motivation is even if you cannot get him impeached, you still create negativity. The appearance of presidential wrongdoing, uh, that this administration is just one scandal after another. Because with impeachment hearings, The media, which is on your side, gets to report as news all of the testimonies of people who don't like the president. And with all of this constant negative reporting, the hopes is that the public will get so sick and tired of hearing all the negativity, they just simply tire of the president. And even though the networks have lost a lot of their influence, they still set the tone and they still work to set the tone. Uh, Last week, James O'Keefe, And the Veritas Project came out with undercover recordings of people at CNN exposing the fact that, as we know, CNN is tailoring the news to favor the Democrats and besmirch the Republicans. Kimberly Strassel, a columnist, a member of the Wall Street Journal editorial board, just published a book entitled Resist at All Cost, How Trump Haters Are Breaking America. She doesn't reveal anything new. But she does a good job of reminding us what happened after Trump won the election back in 2016. The movement to impeach the president started on day one of his presidency. This movement to find some justification for throwing him out of office, whether that be related to his taxes or related to the Russians or things in his personal life or campaign contribution irregularities. Uh, The media, Democratic Party, have made it their mission to delegitimize President Trump. And you're rewarded by your peers if you can come up with some way, some new way to smear the president. So Sasso writes, within a few days of Trump's election, there was officially the resistance. Uh, They were fueled by that second stage anger and it was something to behold. Within hours of Clinton's concession, anti-Trumpers had taken over the streets, engaged in candlelight vigils, marches, riots, crowds, seething around Trump Tower in downtown Chicago. Demonstrations broke out in every major U.S. city from Los Angeles to Dallas to Minneapolis to New York. People wept. People wailed. Anti-Trump protesters in Oakland, California threw Molotov cocktails and M80 firecrackers at police. Angry individuals hoisted banners that read, Time to Revolt or Make America America Smart Again. Portland, Oregon protesters took over the city for most of a week blocking highways, delaying buses, vandalizing businesses and cars. Twitter was besieged with hashtags, never my president, not my president, still with her. Cornell students gathered for a cry-in. The University of Kansas urged students to make use of therapy dogs. The University of Michigan comforted distraught students with coloring books and Play-Doh. The nation's liberal pundits, meanwhile, took to their computers. Timothy Egan of the New York Times explained in his post-election column uh, that he hadn't felt this way since the nuns told our second grade class that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. The New Yorker, uh, David Remnick, penned a piece entitled Presidential Election 2016, an American Tragedy, 
Paul Krugman. We are very probably looking into a global recession with no end in sight. As recently as 2019, presidential candidate Joe Biden in Iowa explained that Trump possessed three fundamental threats to America and that one of these was to our democracy. Everywhere you turn, Trump is tearing down the guardrails of democracy, said Uncle Joe. We're at a moment when we need to reset constitutional norms in this country. So, this is all just a good reminder what took place in 2016, how these people were very serious about resist at all costs. No method was too extreme because th Trump threatens their power. And to prove this point, here's an article from the Washington Post on uh, Inauguration Day, January 20th, 2017. The effort to impeach Donald J. Trump is already underway. At the moment the new commander-in-chief was sworn in, a campaign to build public support for his impeachment went live at impeachdonaldtrumpnow.org, spearheaded by two liberal advocacy groups aimed to lay the groundwork for his eventual ejection from the White House. The organizers behind the campaign, Free Speech for People and Root Action, are hinging their case on Trump's insistence on maintaining ownership of his luxury hotels and golf course businesses while in office. Ethic experts have warned that this financial, uh, these financial, or his financial holdings could potentially lead to constitutional violations and undermine public faith in his decision making. Their effort is early, strategists admit, but they insist it's not premature, even if it triggers an angry backlash from those who will argue that they are not giving the new president a chance. Newt Gingrich also had a piece recently. Uh, the resistance against Trump began de the day he was elected. This is not an impeachment process. The fake impeachment movement taking place as part of an ongoing effort to drive President Trump from office. It is part of a determination on the left that Trump must be expelled from the White House. This coup attempt, which is exactly what it is, has nothing to do with evidence or any single accusation. As House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said when asked what she would do if the whistleblower's accusations involving Ukraine collapsed. She said, we may have other, we shall say, candidates for impeachable offense in terms of the Constitution of the United States, but this is the one that's most understandable to the public. In other words, no matter what evidence and no matter how many times President Trump and his team knocked down the attack, there will always be another effort designed to drive him from office. So now back to Strassel's book. She explains why she believes the left is reacting this way. She writes, people didn't like Trump, the man true. It was outrageous to the left that a real estate baron they had written off as a joke and an imbecile had won and had done so by appealing to the very flyover America that the elites hold in such contempt. Add to this Donald J. Trump's almost unparalleled ability to infuriate his opponents. It isn't just his blunt, impolite style. Over the decades, the press and the liberal elites had grown accustomed to setting the rules of the game, scolding Republicans who failed to play by them, and accepting the ensuing apologies. Trump infuriatingly refused to play. So Strassel's first answer here is that Trump is an outsider who is threatening insider power. You know, after Obama won the White House, uh, do you remember all of those articles written claiming that the Republican Party was finished? Uh, with Obama and what his administration will, will, will be doing, there will never be another Republican in the White House. The Democrats thought that they had permanent control in Washington and Donald Trump shattered their dreams. Strassel goes on to write, but what few on the left or in the media would acknowledge is that this anger also came from something completely aside from Trump. It was a seething fury over losing in general, in particular over losing such a consequential election. Every presidential election matters, but some matter more. In 2016, the election mattered a lot, coming as it did after eight years of Barack Obama's experiment with liberal government. The 44th president had proven 
one of the more radicals in modern history, relentlessly pushing to expand the size of federal government, regulating or taking over private industry, and stocking the courts with activist judges. A Republican Congress had nonetheless forced him to do much of this via regulation and executive order, all of which could be undone. Democrats had soaring ambitions for Hillary Clinton's presidency. She would cement Obama's gains and put the nation irrevocably on the path to the progressive enlightenment. Clinton would make that the new norm and continue to grow the size of government. A Clinton administration would protect Obama's legally dubious moves, the Paris Climate Accord, his executive immigration orders, his crackdown on religious freedom, and the granddaddy of all ambitions, Clinton would nominate liberal Supreme Court judges. Trump's victory demolished this dream and the left's rage was against everyone and everything. Unquote Kimberly Strassel. So the resistance seems to be the typical anger that you get when a group loses power. The more ungodly, the more unprincipled people are, the more angry they become when they lose power. Uh, when they're put out of their position, their source of power, their source of income, you're putting them out of the place where they find meaning and significance. So they're going to be enraged. When King David took the throne of Israel from King Saul, by the will of God, the transition was not easy. It was not just a replacement of kings. The whole house of Saul was put out on the street. And they didn't take it well. Many people died in this transition of power. People sacrificed their lives fighting to get their positions back. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew steadily stronger, but the house of Saul grew weaker continually. The house of Saul, his sons, his relatives, his friends, all thought that they would be the permanent elite class in Israel. Even years later, um, a man from the house of Saul by the name of Shimei was still cursing David, throwing stones at him, calling him a worthless man. Because when ungodly people lose their place of power, they will not let go of their bitterness. Now, this conflict in Israel was not just political, it was actually spiritual. It was on a moral level. The conflict was between choosing the man anointed by God, King David, supported by those religious fundamentalists in Israel, and Saul, man's choice, supported by many who had worldly interests. Where you fell in the political realm represented where you stood spiritually with God. And David was a type of Christ. As people would not receive God's anointed David, thousand years in the future, they would also not receive the truly anointed one of God, Jesus Christ the Messiah. As Jesus said in his parable of the kingdom, uh, Luke chapter 19, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Why? Well, because they want the power for themselves. And the refusal to accept God's chosen one, the refusal to submit to God's authority is a spiritual problem. As in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, the Lord says to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So this wasn't merely about an earthly ruler. These political choices were a reflection of people's attitude toward God's authority, God's law, the king that God sets up. This is why rebellion against God's established authority is condemned in Romans chapter 13, Romans 13, 2, Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. And so what we're seeing in the news, uh, and what we're going to be seeing over the next year in plotting to take down the president, is a typical human struggle for power and position. It's James chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. Uh, You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. But I want to suggest an even deeper reason 
for this resist the president at all costs movement. Because we have seen switches in the parties in the White House without there being this level of outrage. This is more than just my team versus your team. It's more than just I want the job, I want the position, I want the salary. What we're fighting for now is over a culture war, a worldview. The establishment of one's moral positions, one's worldview. Uh, this is abortion, socialism, LGBTQ versus pro-life, economic freedom, pro-traditional family, and gender. And this battle for Washington is really a battle for the maintenance and the continuance of a certain ideology or worldview. And the outrage against this current administration is really being fueled by immoral desires. That's a gasoline in the fire that we've never had before. It's a growing hatred toward biblical morality. And that's the only explanation for this new political resistance. There's no greater hatred than this hatred directed toward God's moral law. In the book of the Revelation, we see a picture of this. In the apocalypse, God is going to raise up two prophets. Revelation chapter 11. We haven't seen prophets like this since the days of the apostles. But in the apocalypse, when the world goes after the global reign of the Antichrist, there are going to be two prophets on earth who are going to represent God. And they will speak and represent a worldview that is hated by this world. But God's going to protect them and nobody can touch them. But when the two prophets finish their testimony, the Antichrist and his people put them to death. But here's the point I want us to see in Revelation chapter 11, verse 9. Those from the peoples and the tribes and the tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwelled on the earth. When they can get rid of the people who espouse God's values, it's Christmas time for the people of this world. That's how much hate there is in this world against God. Jesus said it in the Olivet Discourse about the last days, Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, they will deliver you to tribulation, they will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And we're about to see how true that really is. So we shouldn't be surprised in our day in that we live on the cusp of the apocalypse, that this hatred against God, his values, his people is rising in this world. Has it not been prophesied that the spirit of this world will become hostile to Christ and his people in the last days? Now I could find hundreds of cultural examples of this. I have a computer file filled with them. But here's just one example I find illustrious. Bigotry and hatred. First UK Chick-fil-A to close after LGBT protest. Shortly after the first Chick-fil-A a location in Britain opened, LGBT protesters drove it out of business. LGBT activists had made no secret that they intend to prevent Chick-fil-A from doing any business across the pond. Although the management company had already caved to pressure on Friday, LGBT groups still held a protest on Saturday. We don't want you in our country because we don't agree with the policies and procedures that you have, place, have in place as an organization. You are not welcome in the UK. Stephen Ireland, communications coordinator at UK Pride, declared at the protest. So if the world cannot even tolerate a chicken restaurant owned by a Christian, what do you think they will do with a president who is on the right? And as I've said in the past, the anger against Trump is alarming because Trump is only tangentially aligned with Christian values. Imagine what the world would do with a president who is fully Christian. Imagine what they would do if God came to earth as a man and offered to be their president. Oh, in fact, he did. And within three and a half years, they had him on the cross. Well, the bottom line 
is that the impeachment circus that we're going to be seeing in news over the next year is just another reminder of how the world increasingly hates Christ and Christian values and policies. They hate the pro-life, pro-traditional family position. They consider it repugnant. And this hatred toward God's values are unrelenting. But remember, salvation is granted to those who agree with God, to those who confess their sin, those who relinquish their own authority, those who step down off of the throne of their own heart and allow the Lord Jesus Christ to have his rightful seat, allowing this man to rule over us. And Jesus Christ will rule forever and ever. Well, thank you for making God and Country a part of your discipleship in the Word. You can help out the cause by subscribing to the channel, hitting the like button, or sending a link to this program to friends. If you email me at God and Country uh, Radio at Verizon.net uh, and say subscribe, I'll send you a weekly email with the synopsis of this program and all the links to this program. Sometimes it's easier to uh, keep up with the program. Uh, using emails and sharing the program using emails. Until next week, keep the faith. Earnestly contend for the faith. Continue to live by the word of God. As Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine.